You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Did you know that the EPA reports indoor air can be up to 100 times more polluted than outdoor air? And with most of us spending about 90% of our time indoors, it's important to consider the air we're breathing every day. In my home, air quality is especially important. My husband suffers from seasonal allergies, my son has asthma, and with four dogs and two cats, we need a solution that could handle pet dander too. That's why we use Air Doctor. It filters out 99.99% of harmful contaminants, including allergens, dust mites, pet dander, and even bacteria and viruses. Air Doctor has a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if it's not right for you, you can return it. To try it out, head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code UNBIASED to get up to $300 off any Air Doctor purifier. And just for pod listeners, you'll also get a free three-year warranty, an additional $84 value. Go to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code UNBIASED. to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jess Steyer and Dr. Sarah Scheinman. And today, we are coming to you a little loopy. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. I'm sick with something that my kids brought home. I don't know what's going on. I didn't sleep a wink. Um, I'm looking like Beetlejuice. Sarah's also not on a whole lot of sleep. Um, we're, we're just, we're a little loopy right now, but we kind of feel like this will make for a, for a really solid episode. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, one, thing I what could go not, wrong? one thing I can tell you we're not on is a sugar high. Oh, I like what you did there. So Sarah just dropped a hint. So today's episode is all about the myth that sugar causes ADHD and hyperactivity. So we're we're going to get into that. Sarah, I I didn't even warn you, but I I think we should do a little bit of a an icebreaker, not that we need one. All right. I'm just curious, are you a sweet or a savory person? Ooh, okay. Well, I um I'm a, I I love a chocolate chip cookie. So like in the in the evening times, um my that is my sort of go to treat is I I you know cake cakes are fine I'm I'm cold all the time so ice cream is not great for me, um, but yeah I love 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 chocolate chip cookies they're my favorite what about you okay so first of all it's so funny because I'm the opposite I'm not a cookie person I am team cake. A, a cupcake is like a dream situation for me. Red velvet, a little cream cheese frosting. But I love a sweet and savory combo. So my all-time favorite thing, a sea salt caramel, when you have the chocolatey sweetness of the caramel, and then you have a little salt on top. It's Oh, and forget if it's like that, that big sea salt with a little crunch. It's like the, the chunky guys. The chunky guys. And then just real quick, um, last thing before we get into it. P.S. Sarah and I are doing our best to keep this a short episode, so we're going to see how that goes. <laughs> Do you say caramel or caramel? <laughs> caramel. You say caramel? Yeah. Why add an extra syllable? Oh, well, isn't it spelled caramel with a little A in the I, middle? If we said every word the way it was spelled, like the English language would be very different from the way it, it is. Colonel. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> okay. Well, that's funny. That's your show in your, your Midwest. What did I say? I said, a, yeah. I know, I said something different. I, I said pecan or, like the other day, and someone was like, it's pecan. I'm like, all right. I think. Calm down, your highness. Wait, like, that's so funny. I, you know, that's one of those words I feel like I. I, I don't know. I, I go back and forth with pecan and pecan. Same with Caribbean and Caribbean. I, it's just, it depends on my mood. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Um, should we get into it? We're off to a good start. We're off to a good start. We're trying, to, we're, we're trying to truncate this episode. Keep it in tight. Keep it in tight. Um, all right. So this is interesting to me. Just, you know, a, a, as a parent, every time I go to a birthday party without fail, someone turns to me and says, you know, when the, when the cake comes out, oh, get ready for the sugar rush. I mean, every single time. Every single time. You've heard this. Of course I have. I mean, yeah, it's it's sort of a very, it's a very pervasive uh, 
like myth in our in our society. Yep. I mean, you you sugar will give you uh, you know will make you hyper. Right. I mean, just kids, but but anyone. And there's a really interesting. We'll get into it in a little bit, but there's a, we can pinpoint the root of this myth. And we're going to talk about it in just a little bit. But before we do, we all know that Dr. Scheinman loves a definition. She loves to really, you know, define what it is we're talking about. So when we say sugar, what are we talking about? When we say sugar in in just everyday life, and when we say sugar in biology, we're actually meaning two different but related things. So when, when you know, you and I talk about sugar just in, in life or, or when someone on, on the, um, the playground or at a birthday party says sugar, it probably brings to mind, right, like table sugar, that like granular white stuff that we see just in bowls and we put in our coffee. Um, but in biology, the term sugar actually refers to a certain type of carbohydrate uh, that our body uses for fuel. So sugar, so we need sugar to operate. Our bodies are very, very reliant on sugar. And these are just molecules of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And everything we eat ultimately gets broken down into a molecule that's called glucose, and that is a sugar. Um, but when we talk about sugars more broadly in these carbohydrate molecules, um, generally what we what we what we mean is there are a couple of different classes. So there are mono, monosaccharides and disaccharides, and these are what are called uh, sort of simple sugars or simple carbohydrates. Then we have polysaccharides, which are our sort of complex carbohydrates and, and complex sugars. And, and when then those are, you know, for example, like whole wheats, legumes, um, starches. And then our simple sugars are, you know, what we were talking about earlier, like our cakes, our cookies um, and our, our sweet things. So uh, but just to kind of put it out there that um, that sugar, uh, we, we all need we need sugar to operate. Love it. And just to, you know, you know, the haters going to hate, I just want to clarify here, we need sugar. It's not that we're saying everyone go run out and give your kids a bunch of cookies and cake. I mean, I also think it's perfectly okay, uh, you know, <laughs> for to, to let kids enjoy those things. But there is a difference between sugar and then there's excess sugar, right? I mean, there are certain things, there are certain implications if we take in too much sugar, right? right? Right, right. Okay. And 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 just uh, just to kind of further the explanation a little bit. So when we're talking about table sugar, um, this is a molecule that's called sucrose, which is a disaccharide. That's a combination of glucose of one glucose molecule and one fructose molecule. And I mentioned earlier, glucose is sort of the cur- energy currency of our bodies in biology. It's very important. But s- table sugar, these these simple sugars are like very small molecules, so they're pretty easy for our body to break down. So because as a result of their smaller size, relatively speaking. So our body breaks down these simple sugars like very quickly. So they're absorbed into our bloodstream and provide us with rapid energy. So I I think, you know, as with all like myths, it sort of comes from a grain of truth, right? So when you do eat um, simple sugars or simple carbohydrates, um, you get that rapid spike in um, blood glucose levels is what they're called. But then you also get a corresponding decline that's also quite rapid. So it's not lasting energy that you get, but it is quick. Okay, thank you. Now, the next thing, maybe we should just set the stage. So the myth is that it causes, or I've heard I've heard lots of things about sugar, but you know, it causes, oh, yeah. giving your kid too much <laughs> sugar will cause ADHD, will cause hyperactivity. So just real quick, and we it will cause cancer will cause Alzheimer's disease. All the things. All the things. Yes. It's, 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 it's one of many boogeymen, I think. Um, but yeah, so, so my son, um, he was actually recently diagnosed with ADHD. We've done lots of content podcast episodes on ADHD. So I don't think we'll, we'll deep dive there, but ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is a neurodevelopmental condition, different subtypes of ADHD, but broadly it's characterized by inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Um, multifactorial, right? There's, uh, there is a genetic factor. There are neurological factors, like all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but hyperx an epigenetic and ep- factor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, just wanted to clarify that hyperactivity alone does not mean that a child has ADHD, right? And sugar certainly is not recognized as a cause of either, ADHD and or, or hyperactivity. So shall we get into the roots of the myth? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, because what's so interesting about this particular myth is I mean, sometimes we have myths in health and science and it's like, where the heck did that come from? Yep. Like, I, you just have no idea. It's like, it's a very pervasive, and but it's just, there's no way to know where it came from. But it, you know, but with something like this, it's, it's interesting because you can really, we can really pinpoint it almost to one study, which is kind of cool. Yep. One study and one person, Dr. Benjamin Feingold. Uh, Benji came out in the 1970s with something called the Feingold diet. And now this was an elimination diet, which just right off the bat, we have issues with it. But what it did is it cut out artificial colors, preservatives, and sugar claiming to improve hyperactivity in children. Now, Dr. Feingold, he, his, his whole thing, he reported that 50 to 75% of children with hyperactivity benefited from the diet. If you actually dig into what this quote unquote study was, there was no actual trial. There was no control group. This was just basically a series of observations and anecdotes. Um, it, it was all, it really relied on parental reports of behavior changes after implementing this elimination fine gold diet. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like it, it, it was like, like you said, it was parental self-report, right? So it wasn't like there were actual trained clinicians in, you know, ADHD or hyperactivity or even just children's behavior in general that were assessing these children post and uh, pre and post uh, administration of this diet, right? Like that's not exactly like, like a good, like a well-designed experiment would have probably done something like that, but it was just, oh, the parents' perception. A hundred percent. And I don't want to discredit parental per perception, right? I mean, there is a place for, for that type of research and more qualitative type of work, but this, there was no, there was no structure to this. There was no design. There was no comparison group. There was no control. And so this really, I mean, it's hard for me to even classify this as a study. This was really just a series of anecdotes. Um, and then there was research that followed this that found in reality, there was no significant impact. Fewer than 2% of children actually saw improvements, but it didn't matter. What is the expression? The horse left the stable, the horse left the barn. I always mess up that, that saying. Okay, you live in the country. I don't know what I. You what never this? heard that expression. Barn. The horse left. No. The horse left the stable. I'm pretty sure that's the expression. Sarah, are you kidding me? You never heard this. I'm a Brooklyn girl, and I've I heard of that long before. <laughs> I know, I know. I just I I feel you know that I live under a rock. By okay, now, so. my point is that even those studies came out after the fact, showing that this was not a real thing. It was too late. The word got out that this diet, you know, when you eliminate sugar, which that even that statement, I feel like based on what you how you set the stage, Sarah, like there, you can't you're really. not eliminating sugar. Um, but but it, it didn't matter. This was getting out in popular press, parents were talking about it, and the seed had been planted. Um, so then should we move on? There was a really, really, really big meta-analysis that came out actually a couple of decades later. This was in the 90s, specifically 1995. And I'm probably going to butcher the, the lead author's name, uh, Walrake. Is that how you pronounce that? I'm really bad with pronunciations, but you always say that I don't need to worry about that. So thank you. And not that I, not that you don't need to worry about it, but just that there are no set rules for pronunciation of okay. names. I mean, it's just the wild west with regards to no to that, disrespect. So. If I am saying it incorrectly, I believe the lead author's name was Walrake. Um, this was uh, a meta analysis that examined sixteen double blind placebo controlled trials. Trials, excuse me. Each of the studies contained within the meta analysis included random assignment to sugar or placebo conditions with neither the participants nor the researchers knowing which was administered. So this was real deal. This was 16 different randomized controlled trials that did a really good job assessing or teasing out, you know, what is actually happening as a result of, of the of the sugar and what is just due to chance, right? And so this meta analysis found no significant effect of sugar on children's behavior or 
cognitive function. I also just want to mention it included data from hundreds, several hundreds of children. Um, it it incl- Depending on the studies that we talk about that were included in the meta-analysis, some focused on, um, I hate to say this, normal children. I'm, I mean, children who were not diagnosed with hyperactivity and children who were diagnosed with hyperactivity. It also covered various types of sugar, including sucrose, aspartame. It assessed behavioral and, and cognitive outcomes. Outcomes, it used standardized measures. And again, the big takeaway was there is no impact. And what's interesting is that they use placebo controls. So they had some children eat, uh, in, in some of these 16 studies, I mean, they had some children eat sugars, uh, eat foods that they perceived to have sugar in them, but actually had had no more sugar than, than the uh than, than the other type of food that was given as the treatment, which actually did what was high in sugar, but was not perceived to be as such. Well, so. so you're setting the stage for the expectation effect. Do right. you want to maybe talk yeah, about that's exactly what I wanted? To what that is? Well, the expectation effect is is as the name would imply a very strong um, uh, psychological biases that w- we all have that when we think that we are going to see in a given outcome, we are more likely to perceive that that outcome is taking place um, as as opposed to if we think that um, something is not going to take place at all. So that's the reason why we have actually randomized placebo-controlled trials is to eliminate that type of bias on the part of the uh, participants in the research study and on the part of the scientists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love it. So that we don't see things that aren't there because we expect to. Right. Psychologically. A hundred percent. And so then when people say, okay, well, I've seen my kids at birthday parties or whatever, you know, after they have a slice of cake, they're running around, they get hyper. I mean, how do you explain that? The answer is look at the environment that they're in. They're in a room with bouncy houses or whatever is at the party, you know, with a group of their friends. It's it's the situation. It's the environment they're in, right? And that's what's exciting. I get hyper at parties. <laughs> like I'm around my friends. Like I get excited. I'm 31. I get excited when I'm at parties. I do too. It's yes. Um, so parties and social events are just inherently stimulating, right? They're high energy. Yep. Um, there can also be other explanations like disruption. So if your kid is missing their nap or if they went to bed late, that might also impact behaviors. But Sarah, as a neurobiologist, I do have a question for you. So yeah. what, I mean, is there anything that is going on in our brain? Like when we consume sugar, is there any release or something that's happening that might trigger an increase in energy? Yeah. Okay. Tell us. Yes, there, there actually is. Um, I, cause this, it, it kind of raises the question of me, why is sugar so rewarding? Why do we love it so much? Um, and one, one possible explanation kind of sort of go, goes back to, uh, if we, if we think about things evolutionarily, right? So our ancestors were, they were hunters and gatherers. So they were out um, looking for food. It, it's not like they could just go to the grocery store and buy, you know, some ramen noodles if they were I'd hungry. be a goner. Um, you yeah. Just, goner. Yeah, so like <laughs> there was, food scarcity was a huge part of their day-to-day life. So they they sort of from uh, from early on uh, taught that that high energy foods were beneficial for survival. So if you could find calorically dense, sugary type foods, uh, they were a quick source of energy. And and so we're sort of hardwired from way back then to crave these types of foods is one explanation. So then of course, like what what happens when you eat the sugary foods? Like why why now is it still so rewarding? Because we are not in a food scarcity environment, most of us. And um, you know, so why do we still crave it? So basically, uh, when we eat something sugary, uh, a chocolate chip cookie in my case, there are taste receptors on our tongue that uh, kind of pick up the sweetness and then send signals directly to our brain through up through the brainstem and then eventually activate a part of our brain called the mesolimbic dopamine system or the limbic system more more simply. And this is um this is just a part of our brain called the reward system. And it answers the very simple question, uh the limbic system answers the very simple question of should I do this again? 
As a public health scientist and a busy mom, finding time for exercise and staying on top of my health is always a challenge. That's why I'm excited to share a hot tip that has made all the difference for me, my AmazeFit smartwatch. AmazeFit is one of the top smart wearable brands known for their innovative features and stylish designs. I've been using the AmazeFit active watch, and I love how it helps me keep track of my pace and progress as I build up my stamina. Whether I'm out for a walk with the dogs or squeezing in a hike, it's the perfect tool to stay motivated and reach my goals. Plus, its long battery life means that I don't need to stress about charging it constantly. So if you want to up your game, check out amazefit.com slash unbiased and use the code unbiased to get 15% off your purchase. That's amazefit.com slash unbiased. And don't forget to use the code unbiased for 15% off. And so that warm feeling you get when you take like the first bite of a chocolate chip cookie or your favorite candy bar or cake is that's your limbic system saying, yes, absolutely do that again. And, and that's because of the release of a chemical in our brain called dopamine. So it's a, ve- so that's sort of a, our feel good neurotransmitter. And it, it kind of activates the limbic system and it says like, yes, what you're doing, keep doing. So that's kind of what's happening our, when we eat sugar is it's a very rewarding experience because it activates the limbic system. Well, I have a question for you then, because I've heard people say, um, you know, they're addicted to sugar. How do you feel about that term in light of what you're just describing, this reward system? I mean, can can someone be addicted to sugar? Well, Interestingly enough, the pathway that I just described is a very similar pathway to the one that's activated in people that are addicted to alcohol and drugs. There is some controversy with regards to the term addiction when it refers to sugar consumption, though, because um, and everyone's brains are a little bit different, right? So some people may have certain more more addictive tendencies or a higher concentration of these dopamine receptors in, in the mesolimbic dopamine system and different parts of you know, the, the portions of the brain that make up this circuit. Um, so we can't really say for certain that sugar addiction doesn't exist. But addiction is a very strong word and it has a lot of clinical connotations and a lot of neurobiological connotations. Um, it's very, it's very, very habit forming, though. Um, so if you eat and since it does activate the reward system to an extent, um, it's it can be a uh, it can be very, it can be almost addicting for certain people, sugar. Mm -hmm. Got it. But I hear that you're still sort of like, I don't want to say holding back. I I agree with you. That word addiction really does carry some very strong clinical implications. Because when we say addiction, it it implies sort of like a, 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 negative sort of withdrawal when you don't have it. And I mean, certain people that if they, if they're eating just large, large volumes of sugar on an everyday basis, which I mean, we should probably talk about the negative health connotations of that in and of itself too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you, if you are used to engaging in a certain behavior and then you abruptly stop it, I mean, that, that's going to have some negative implications, but it's not like you're going to go through um, withdrawal symptoms. It's not like you're going to, you know, start, start shaking or be at risk for seizures or, um, the, the, you know, the very dangerous withdraw, withdrawal symptoms that are associated with um, mm-hmm. psychoactive drug addiction, for example. So let's shift then to what are the negative imp- or potential negative implications of excess sugar intake? So um, just looking at public health recommendations. I know the World Health Organization has put out this advisory. They recommend limiting sugar intake to less than 10% of daily calories to promote better overall health. I always kind of chuckle with this stuff. It's like, what does that mean? You know, like, how does that translate? Like, I I guess the, the TLDR is you don't want sugar to make up the like large majority of your diet, right? I, I guess I'm just thinking as a parent, it's just, yeah, you know, well, as a parent and a, as a public health scientist who's grounded in like what's practical, like there might be some days where, y- you know, you, you exceed that threshold. So I just, li- I just always like to emphasize like 
Don't guilt yourself. I totally get it. You know, there are going to be days where that's just unrealistic. And I guess, you know, the overall focus should be on overall dietary patterns. Um, you know, of course you want your kid and, and, and yourself to have a diverse diet and, and you want to shy away from, from excess sugar. The reason being that it, you know, uh, linked to poor nutrition, weight gain, increased risk of chronic conditions. Um, and Sarah, I know, you know, we're, we're working, I, I don't know of the timing, if the newsletter is going to come out before this episode airs or after, <laughs> But, but you also raised some really interesting um, potential consequences of repeated excess sugar intake um, on, on the brain. Can you talk about some of those things? Right. So um, there are actually negative connotations to uh, for brain health for consuming too much sugar, but there's also negative connotations to brain health if you consume not enough sugar. You got to find the sweet spot. Sorry, that was a pun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of myself. So proud. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Sorry. Go on. Bye. It was nice knowing you all. <laughs> Don't leave me. All right. Go on. That was so dumb. <laughs> but you, what do you mean? That was so great. It's true. You have to find the sweet spot. You do. No, as with, I mean, homeostasis is, is right. Like that's, probably my favorite concept in biology. I mean, and, and most of the most complex concepts in biology, especially as it relates to our bodies, like really all just comes down to like maintaining homeostasis, like not going too far above or too far below the, the sweets that, the, yeah, the sweet spot of, of various levels of, you know, like whether it be hormones, neurotransmitters, what have you. It's, it's, it basically comes down to that. So, I mean, there have been studies done in the brain in neuroscience, uh, connecting high, uh, blood glucose levels. So, uh, to problems with like thinking, memory, learning, synaptic transmission, cell growth and repair. Uh, these are all uh, conditions that are severely impacted um, when blood, glu- blood glucose levels are too high. But they're also the same functions that are severely impacted when your blood glucose levels are too low. So when you have sort of a, it's called hypogly- hypoglycemia, um, when you have really low blood sugar. So it's, it's, you know, you can't have like too, too much. There's such a thing as too much of a good thing, but uh, you also like be very, very important to, to make sure that your blood sugar maintained is maintained at a certain level. I got to jump in there. We say everyone, myself, my, my husband, my two kids, we get hangry when we haven't eaten. Can you, so is that, that's a sort of a hypoglycemia and we get irritable. Yeah. And so that's, what's going on there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, so, so your brain is one organ in the, in the, in the body. Um, and it, it only makes up 2% of your entire body weight, but it consumes estimates uh, vary, but are generally focused around this 20% mark. So it consumes roughly 20% of your, your total body energy expenditure. So it requires a lot of glucose to function properly. And so, of course, when your blood sugar levels get too low, you're, your brain is not getting the glucose that it's re- that is required. So the parts of your brain that regulate thinking and decision making and communication are not going to have sufficient um, blood flows, sufficient energy um, for the cells to be functioning at peak capacity. So it, it can a hundred percent result in changes in behavior. Now, Sarah, in the um, I'm looking through the the newsletter draft here. You're talking about. Did you already talk about this? The cerebral small vessel disease. Did you already touch on oh, that? It, no, or... I did not. I did not talk about that. Okay, let's because uh, that piqued my interest. Well, is it po- one of the possible consequences of uh, overconsumption of sugar? Um, so, uh, and and it can occur. But basically, what what cerebral small vessel disease is is it occurs when the small small vessels in the brain. So your brain is encased in um, uh, this this dynamic barrier called the blood brain barrier. It's sort of like a mesh casing, um, but instead of mesh, it's blood vessels. Um, so it's really cool, but it's also like very, very highly regulated to make sure that like certain things do and don't get into the brain. Um, so what happens with uh, overconsumption of sugar is it can lead to an increased risk in developing um, this condition that happens when the small but these small vessels become damaged and this leads to impaired blood flow to the brain and 
that's how glucose enters into the brain is through the blood. Because when you eat something, when you eat sugar or, or anything else, uh, it the molecules get broken down into that molecule glucose and it goes into the blood. And then through the blood, it travels to all of our organs, including the brain. So it's really, that's a very serious complication that can occur um, that's associated with um, sh- overconsumption of, of sugar and, and just in, more broadly, a, a, a um, not a very well-balanced diet. Right. So, I mean, obviously that sounds really scary, but to be clear, and I don't know that we can, it's not like, you know, obviously people want to know, well, what, what do you mean by overconsumption? I mean, I, I, and without being able to define it super clearly, my understanding would be really excess levels of sugar over a repeated, really chronic period of time. Again, this just goes back to, like, we're not talking about your kid ate a, you know, a couple of cupcakes at a party. We're not, that, that's not what, what you're describing here. We're talking about repeated behavior, patterns of, you know, of sugar, excess sugar consumption. And I was just thinking, because like this morning, I, we woke up late. I had to rush my kids out the door. And so they had a bowl of, I don't know, some sort of cereal that we bought at Trader Joe's. There were little pink and purple things. There, No doubt there was a lot of <laughs> sugar in the cereal. I'm not concerned about what you just described because my kids are not only eating those things, right? It's part of a, like, they're going to come home at lunch. They're having some protein, some veggies at dinner. I'm going to make them. You know, so again, I just, I I feel like people hear these things. This just makes me think about how you have these seeds of truth. Like what you're describing is very real, obviously, but it will be taken out of context and then be used to completely vilify sugar completely. And then you have people who just go, you know, bananas. And I'm yeah. <laughs> sorry, what, what were you going to say? <laughs> well, no, I was just going to say like, I, I, and then I could go into, uh, we're trying to make this a shorter episode and be a little more brief, but I could also go into like a very, uh, like a way more detail about the dangers of not consuming enough sugar. Well, because that's a whole different kind of hustle for okay. your body. Oh, okay. Maybe not a super deep dive, but like a t- sort of TLDR with a can you can you tell us a little bit more about that well I mean I I, I briefly I briefly alluded to it yeah. but I mean it, it is it is a huge problem for your brain if you don't get enough if your blood glucose levels are too low uh, your brain is not going to be able to operate if, at peak capacity which is probably um, why uh, I mean because I, like I don't have any kids but I mean having your kids go to school without breakfast, for example, like they're going to have some trouble concentrating, right? Right. And that's because their blood glucose levels are too low. They don't have enough sugar in their body. And just to be clear, like we're not saying you have to feed your kid, you know, fruit snacks and cake. You can get, and we already touched on this, right? But there are lots of sugar sources, what you were describing. It's not like we're saying you have to, when we say sugar is necessary, we're not saying cakes and cookies are necessary, right? Right. <laughs> right. It's it, when we say sugar, we are not just referring to sucrose. For some reason, sucrose gets a bad name because it's a disaccharide instead of a polysaccharide. But all of that, basically, what that just means is that, like, it is going to increase your blood glucose levels at a more rapid rate, and then they're going to decline at a correspondingly rapid rate. We'll have to do another episode, and we've done some content on this, but like. High fructose corn syrup is a very, you know, we, we get a lot of questions about that and then differentiating like different sugar sources like, you know, um, table sugar that you were describing versus honey versus agave versus maple syrup and all those things. And does our body actually know the difference uh, when it comes to the breakdown of, like you were saying, sucrose and fructose and, and all those things? Or does it generally all pretty much get processed the same way. I don't know if you want to just comment briefly on that, but I know here I am rambling. The LDR is, um, it all does get broken down to glucose. Glucose is the molecule that are, that is the only molecule that can activate the production of the hormone insulin, which is produced by the pancreas. And that's what what tells our, our cells to go ahead and, and um, take up the glucose that's into the blood. But anything that you eat Anything that you eat, whether it's complex carbohydrate, simple carbohydrate, um, fruit, vegetables, cakes, sugars, it's all ultimately going to be broken down into this molecule called glucose that our cells use for currency. So to an extent, the body doesn't care where the glucose comes from, just that we have it in our bloodstream and we can use it to fuel our bodies. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. I guess the only other thing I'd say is that, of course, when we're talking about certain foods that are, I mean, now I'm coming back to the idea of 
excess sugar. Um, you have to think that certain foods that taste really good, they're going to have other ingredients, like maybe there's a lot of salt in them and whatever it is. Like, again, it's not, we're, we're really focused on sugar itself. Does it cause, I mean, the, the point of this episode is really supposed to be focused on does it cause hyperactivity and ADHD? And I, I hope that we have convinced you all that that was based on this this one, I, I'm using air quotes, study back in the 70s that has been debunked, debunked, debunked. But there are other, I don't want to say issues, but yeah, issues surrounding diets that are high in excess sugars and other ingredients. And again, it's all about patterns. I just, I always, I, here I am, I'm beating a dead horse and I hate that expression, but I hate the guilt that comes with being a human, being a parent, like when you open up your social media, it's just like everything, like it, it's everything is just so absolutist and, and black scary and, and black and white. And it's so it, it's I, I don't know, I, I appreciate that you really got into the nuance of it all. And I, I think it helps at the stage as part of this, again, this larger conversation that we're not saying go run out and your diet, you know, it's perfectly fine to eat cakes and cookies all the time. But every now and then, like, treat yourself, you know? So anyway, uh, that's Parks and Rec. I don't yeah, know if you're and a I Parks mean, like, and Rec and, person. And just even, yeah. no, but I've heard that because um, <laughs> I'm a human in the world. I just want to note that there's just, even though sugar can, add, can and does activate the, the mesolimbic dopamine system or the reward system in the brain, there is no evidence to support that's, that um, the activation of this system is associated with sustained hyperactivity following sugar consumption in children or adults. There's some evidence to support that like frequent consumption of sugar right. and sugary foods can contribute to, you know, overall poor diet quality, which can negatively impact brain function and behavior. You know, what I always like to say is that what's good for your general health is also good for the health of your brain. But really, there's just no link to hyperactivity. Love it. Love it. How, do we stop there? I mean, I think this was really great. Sarah, I think we actually yeah. tightened up a little bit for us. This was we impressive. Did. We totally did. We really hope that you took something away from this episode. I, as usual, learned so much from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for, for really getting into the neurobiology of, of sugar and how it impacts the brain. As always, y'all know, follow along on social media. We do our daily infographics. We actually have an infographic dropping on this topic and a newsletter, definitely make sure to subscribe to our Substack. Totally free to subscribe. Um, Sarah's been crushing it as a co-author um, on a bunch of these newsletters. So thank you to Sarah. Um, you can subscribe at theunbiasedipod.substack.com. Last thing, reviews actually go a really long way for us. If you can leave a review on Apple, if you're on YouTube, subscribe, review, all the things. It actually really helps us grow our audience so that we can actually have an impact because we don't want to just you know, talk into the void, right? So anyway, with that, Sarah, you want to take us home? Thanks so much for tuning in, you guys. We really appreciate it. And uh, join us next week for some more uh, no-nonsense, just science. <laughs> <laughs>